We're going to open up with Luke chapter 18, verse 35. Today is going to be an easy day because no one has to read. You don't even have to open your Bible. I got all of the scriptures for you. If you can see them, great. If you if you can't, I'll uh, call the scripture out and you can grab it. Luke 18, 35. And it came to pass that as he came nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they went before, rebuked him, that he should, not, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What will thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Christians think that we no longer have to keep all of the commandments listed in the Bible. That's the purpose of this message today. But the Bible says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into that city. Give me one second. I just want to make sure I got this going. Hold on one second. She had a double act up at the last minute. <laughs> okay. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. All right. There are some that say that living holy is too hard. But the Bible says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It doesn't take all of that. That's what some people say, or it's not that necessary. But Matthew 5 says, if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your eye offend thee, pluck it out, sorry. And if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. There's some people that say that it cannot be done. But the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You notice the word I just said, holiness. That's a word you don't hear no more. People don't talk about it anymore. It's taboo. It's almost like a cuss word. No one wants to use the word holiness anymore because it's a, a taboo word that people think you can't do anymore. There are some that say that God's grace covered it all. But the Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you can see what's going on here, I'm trying to create a pattern and let you know that God does want you to live holy. You can live holy and God would instruct you to do something that's not possible that you cannot do. This, unfortunately, is the name it and claim it generation. This is the believe it and receive it generation. And the Bible says God is coming back for a glorious church. That's for all of you who think you don't have to go to church. Not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This used to be my favorite scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a plan for your life before your mama met your dad. God has a plan of peace. God is not interested in sending anyone to a devil's hell. God is here and he, he has created you and he known you from before you in your mama's womb and he does have no desire to destroy you. He wants you to reign with him. He wants you to reign with him in his kingdom and he has provisions. He has everything set up for you so that you can have that expected end that he's talking about in Jeremiah 29, 11. We don't believe in luck because we believe that God is in full control. We don't believe in rabbit's foot. And I've always wondered how did the rabbit lose the foot? We don't believe in zodiac signs. Zodiac signs are, are basically saying that your destination, your destiny is predetermined, is predetermined by your birthday. You're not here to just take up space. You're not on earth just to live for 80 years. And in 80 years, you just have to figure it out. You do have a purpose. And your purpose shouldn't be just to be a buyer and a seller, go to school, get a job, be a consumer, buy things and, and, and drop dead. Your purpose on this earth is a purpose that God has for you from before you was born. It is your job to figure out what that purpose is. And it is your job to follow hard after God. 
This is the reason why God said, separate yourself and come out from among them. This is the reason why God said, love not the world, world, neither the things that are in the world. Second Corinthians 6, 17. Since God has a plan for your life, and since he wants you to separate yourself, there's a reason he wants you to separate yourself. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. When will he receive you? When you touch not the unclean thing. I need y'all to help. Talk back to me. Yes. You cannot please God and the world. I need y'all to listen to me. This is very important. If you listen to what I'm telling you today, you'll know how to get the Holy Ghost. If you listen to what I'm telling you today and do exactly what I'm telling you, you get the Holy Ghost today. God says you cannot please him and the world. You got to make a choice. You can't have both. You can't have a little bit of this and a little bit of God. You can't straddle the fence. Straddle the fence means you're just walking on the fence. You're in this neighbor's yard and you're in your yard at the same time. You got to pick one. You got to be all the way over here all the way over here. God doesn't have anything to do with you if you're all the way over there. God wants to be God of all, or he doesn't want to be God at all. Got it? God wants to be the God of all, or he doesn't want to be God at all. And these scriptures that I'm giving you aren't examples of God not caring about you. These are examples of God caring about you and showing you what you need to do and giving you examples and giving you uh, um, encouragement and trying to get you to him. So, Big question. I want all of you all to answer this in your own mind. What do you love? If the first thing that comes to your mind isn't God, then we have an issue. Because that should have been the first thing that came to your mind when I said, what do you love? What is the first thing you reach for in the morning? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you reach for? Is it your phone? Is it Instagram? Is it Facebook? Is it to call somebody? What is the first thing you reach for in the morning? My glasses. Your glasses. <laughs> you got your glasses, and now you can pray. <laughs> what do you end your day with? I'm so glad you're here. What do you end your day with? What brings you the most pleasure? Uh, I end my day with TV. I go to sleep watching TV. Whatever it is, if it's not <laughs> God, you have just been introduced to your God. Congratulations. Now know who your God is. Whatever you reach for first, it should have been God. John 2.15, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. God wants to be God of all, or he doesn't want to be God at all. You don't get to pick and choose how this works. You don't get to have a life, choose your own life, live your own life, go to school, get a job, do everything that you're supposed to be do, supposed to do, and then add a little bit of God to your life, or add a little bit of salvation to your life or be a little bit more spiritual, or be a little bit more moral, or have some values. God wants you to completely follow hard after him, completely separate yourself from this world and from everybody and everything in it. Because he's a jealous guy. As a matter of fact, he said his name is Jealous. Good, big, last question on this slide. Why don't you enjoy the presence of God? If you do enjoy the presence of God, why didn't you reach for that when you first woke up in the morning? There's your proof right there. Why don't you enjoy music that brings him glory? Why do you enjoy music that, that gives your flesh power? Why don't you want God's presence with you when you wake up in the morning, when you go to sleep at night, when you're driving in your car, when you're riding in your car, when you're sitting in the bathroom, when you're standing in the shower, why don't you want God's presence all over you? There was a dude and he came to Jesus and he asked him, what must he do to be saved? It's real important whenever you read the Bible and somebody asks that question, because that's the most important question in the whole Bible. There's nothing more important in the whole world than what must I do to be saved? All of you need to think about that for a second. Do I know what it takes to be saved? What exactly, what are the exact precise steps that I have to do to be saved? Do you know, 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 do you know? This dude asks God Almighty, what must he do to be saved? It'll be different if you ask your pastor. It'll be different if you ask your mother. It'll be different if you ask your friends. But he asked God, what do you got? Yes, that's what I want. He asked God, what must I do to be saved? Who would know better? Who would have a better answer for it? So it's important, look what God said. And he said unto him, I didn't write the whole scripture, I just shortened it for you. He said unto him, why do you call me good? 
there's none good but one, and that's God. This is Jesus, you know. I, we're going to get into that in another, in another lesson. Jesus is kind of just letting him know, I, I know that you know I'm God. He's just kind of telling him that he's God. But that's not the point. That's not the subject for this lesson. If you want to enter into life, that's what it means when it says, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. That's for all the people who think that you don't have to keep the commandments. Right? That's for all the people who think you just have to live more. That's for all the people who think all you have to do is do the right thing. Just be good. Just have some values. Just go to church. Just don't kill anybody. That's not what God said. God said, keep the commandments. I wish y'all could say it with me. Keep the commandments. It's really easy. If you want to be saved, keep the commandments. If you want the Holy Ghost, you have to accept that you have to keep the commandments. Which commandments? All of them. Jesus said, my grace covered it all. When the guy asked him, what must I do to be saved? Is that what he said? Yes. He said, my grace covered it all, or did he say, keep the commandments? I tell y'all what, I'm going to tell you what I think he said, and y'all tell me what Jesus said. Got it? When the guy asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He said, don't worry about it. He said, keep the commandments. When he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, do the best you can. Keep the commandments. When he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He said, be moral. Keep the he said, keep good values. Keep the commandments. Just go to church. Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. I'm trying to get somebody saved. I'm trying to save somebody soul. I'm trying to be that one person that brings God a worshiper. I'm trying to get somebody to think that the way that the church is going now is the complete opposite and wrong direction. These churches are name it and claim it churches and these churches are mo have motivational speakers posing as pastors and they're telling you how to get rich and they're telling you how to get money and they're telling you what prophecies are coming for you and you're gonna get a house and a car. I always wanted to know once I obtained all of these things, now what? Because I still don't have salvation. And the only way to have salvation, the only way to escape this planet when destruction coming, is to keep the commandments. Who said that? Jesus said that. Did he write that? Yes. Read now. Keep the commandments. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, this is a person who came, this was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus. Y'all remember him? He came to Jesus and he asked Jesus pretty much the same question. This is just another character reference that I have for you. And Jesus held him. Can you imagine God hugging you? And you ask God, what can, what do I have to do? What's wrong with me? Evaluate you, God. Because that's the best person that you should ask to evaluate you. Imagine you asking God, what do I have to do to be saved? And God grabs you and holds you and tells you, there's one thing you lack. Keep the commandments. Yeah, there's one thing, there's one problem. How badly would you want to know what that one thing is? I would sell everything I got. I would pay every dollar I got. I would work for the rest of my life for free if God can tell me the one thing, mm -hmm. the one thing that I lack. And when you are seeking the Holy Ghost, most of the time, if you listen to somebody who's received the Holy Ghost and you listen to their testimony, most of the time they'll tell you it was one thing. How badly do you want to know what your one thing is? Because how badly you want to know what this one thing is, defines how badly you want to be saved. Yeah. What will you do to find out what the one thing is? So you're laying in God's arms. You're laying in his bosom. He's holding you because he loves you, because he has thoughts of peace for you. He has an expected end for you. And he's telling the guy, you lack one thing. The difference with this guy is, and this is where some people get mixed up is, he personally, just him, was in love with his money. He had too much money. He was hoarding it up. That was a problem for him. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with having more than you need, but you have to do the right thing with it, of course. But that was his specific problem. What's yours? What's yours? How bad do you want God to tell you? Did you ask him? Yep. Did you ever ask him, God, what, what, search me, God. Find out what's inside of me that's not like you. What's it, whatever's in me, Lord, whatever it costs, whatever pain, whatever sorrow is going to cause me, take it out. Take it away from me. I don't want it because I want to be like you. I want to be with you. I want this out and I want to get right. When you start talking like that, then God listen. Then Peter said unto him, 
This is this is uh, the, an apostolic's favorite scripture, Acts two thirty eight. These are, these were this is another character reference that I have where there was multiple people asking uh, Jesus what to be saved. This time I think it was thousands of people at this point, and they were asking the apostles, "What must we do to be saved?" And the first thing Peter said, what's the first thing he said? Repent. Go to church. Repent. Be moral. Repent. Have values. Repent. Get baptized. Repent. repent. The first thing he said that you have to do to be saved is repent. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to find out what that word means, courtesy of my daughter, KK. This was a, a request from her. This was a question for her. And it took me since then till now to prepare this to explain what repent means. Don't listen to what anyone says about Jesus coming to destroy the law. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. What that means is Jesus never done away with the commandments. He kept all of the commandments and then he taught the commandments. He taught his apostles the commandments and he taught his apostles to teach the commandments. Deuteronomy 6, I didn't write the scripture, but I'm 99% sure this is Deuteronomy 6, 5. It says, now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments. Did you catch that? It's not just the commandments. It's commandments, statutes, and judgments. So if you think Jesus came to get rid of the commandments, okay, let's just say I agree with you. I don't, but let's just say I agree with you. I can get rid of the statutes too. Give me a book, scripture, and verse for that, please. What about the judgments? Did he get rid of that too? Give me a book, a chapter, and a verse where I can read that because it's not in there. Which the Lord your God commanded you to teach. The commandments, God commanded you to teach them that you may do them in the land wherever you go to possess it. Almost done, y'all. That you might fear the Lord thy God, keep all of his statues. Are y'all reading with me? Yes. And his commandments. Notice he put statues first. And his commandments, what I commanded thee, thee thou, and your son. This is not just for you, it's for your kids too. And thy son's son, your grandkids, all of your kids that you inherit. And all the days of thy life, that the days may be prolonged. Here's what some folk would do. I'm sorry? This is what some folk would do. They'll start listening to commandments in, in error, basically. They'll start trying to get you to see which commandments that you can't keep. Because what people want to do today is they don't want to keep the commandments. And you, any commandment that people will start to complain about is typically the commandment that they don't want to do. Right? That's what it is. Every time you think about getting saved and you think it's too hard and you don't really want to do it, the problem that you have is an issue within your own self. It's things that you simply don't want to do. But I beg you to just give it up because it's not worth it. Your soul salvation is not worth it. When God cracks the sky and comes back for his people, when the trumpet sounds, it won't even matter. Whatever music you're listening to, they're not listening to that in heaven. Whatever club you're going to, there's no clubs in heaven. Whatever it is that you want to do, how valuable is it when this is all over? Save yourself from this untoward generation. Salvation is a selfish thing. You have to save yourself. The only way you can save yourself is with a clean mindset. How badly do you want it? How much of your life have you already spent serving the devil, doing what he wants you to do, lending your members to him? Will you spend the rest of your life doing that? Are you going to switch it up a little bit and start serving for God for a couple of years and then go back to the world? Will you follow hard after God? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. The Lord our God is one Lord. Sorry. One Lord, one God. I'll come back to that. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, not straddle the fence, not get saved a little bit and, and, and have one foot in, one foot out. I'm not gonna do all of that. I'm gonna do a little bit of this, do a little bit of that. I'm gonna listen to this, I'm gonna watch that. I'm gonna just do a little bit of this, but I'm still gonna be saved for God knows my heart. Love the Lord with all thy heart. I'm gonna make a point here. And with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words that I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Here's what you gotta do with the words that God commanded you. And thou shalt teach them diligently to your children. 
and shall talk of them when you sittest in the house and when thy walk is by the way when you're walking down the street with your children teach them the commandments when you're sitting in your house teach the commandments and when you lie us down when you lay down and go to bed teach the commandments and when you get back up in the morning, teach the commandments. Does it sound like God don't care about his commandments? Does it sound like he just don't want you to do it? Does it sound like something that he just don't want you to do and he just gonna let you come into his kingdom anyway when you get to his kingdom and not keep the commandments? Does that make sense? Here are the commandments. See the 10 commandments there? I want you to watch this. I wanted y'all to remember what I said in six, five. I think I need to go back. Uh, let's do Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said unto them, isn't it nice? Y'all don't have to read from me. Y'all don't have to open your Bible. I got the scriptures here for y'all. But y'all don't have it in front of you. So how y'all read the scriptures? Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said unto them, unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Well, didn't we just read that? We read that in Deuteronomy, right? Mm -hmm. Love the Lord with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Remember the other scripture said with all thy might. Is might mind? I don't know. Listen to this, this is very important. Jesus said, this is the first and great commandment. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. If you read the 10 commandments, what does it say? What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other God before me. But now Jesus is saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Confused yet? Maybe the commandments aren't just the Ten Commandments. Maybe the commandments are every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Maybe the commandments are every scripture in the Bible. Every scripture in the Bible. Maybe those are the commandments. Let's find out. Verse number 39, Matthew 22. And the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wait a minute. What's the second commandment? The second commandment is, Thou shalt have no graven, thou shalt make no graven, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thank you, you saw that. You should not make a graven image. But Jesus just said the second commandment is love thy neighbor. Jesus confused about his own commandments. He wrote them and gave them to Moses. He didn't forget what he wrote. He's the same God yesterday and today and forevermore. Maybe all of the commandments are not just the 10 commandments. Maybe we need to obey all of the Bible, everything in there. Why did Jesus quote an Old Testament? Anyway, remember we read it. Thou shalt love the look, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's written right here. That's Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. If the commandments was done away with in the New Testament, I don't believe the Old Testament no more. Why is Jesus quoting the Old Testament? Why is Jesus telling you to follow the scriptures in the Old Testament? You, you probably need to come to the next class I'm going to have that will teach you the difference between Old Testament and New Testament so you can get a good understanding. It's not a separation of old and new. It's no two different Bibles. Some people have only an Old Testament Bible. Some people only have a New Testament Bible. They don't understand how it works. This is Old Testament, or the word testament simply means covenant. And God made a covenant. His people, we broke the covenant. And God is so nice and so gracious that he made a new covenant. That's all it means. The same statues, the same commandments, are in the Bible, they have not changed. The only thing that Jesus changed was the sacrificial and the ceremony laws because he became the lamb and he died and he shed his blood so that you don't have to kill a lamb every time you sin. That's the only thing that changed, got it? I'm almost done, trust me. What's the opposite of a friend? Quick. All right, Jesus said, and I didn't write this uh, scripture down for this. Ye are my friends, if, if you do whatever I command you. I thought we were supposed to just obey the Ten Commandments. Somebody said that, somebody believed that. But all I gotta do is obey the Ten Commandments and I'm good. Jesus said, you're my friends, if you do whatever I command you. 
the word if means that there's a consequence if you don't do it. So if you don't do whatever he commands you, then are you his friend? John 15. John uh, 15, 4. If you do what God commands you, you are his friend. Tell me, Kelly, if you don't do what God commands you, are you his friend? No. What are you? His you're his enemy. Exactly. 15, 14? Yeah. God expects you to do exactly what he says. The commandments are not optional. All right. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I command you. All right. Teach them to observe all things whatever I have commanded. So these are just scriptures that I wrote down, that I typed down here. Most of them are what Jesus said. He said, you're his friend if you do what I command you. Teach them to observe all things whatever I commanded. If you know these things, ye are happy if you do them. See the theme here? Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter into the kingdom, but, see this is for those folks who believe that all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. The Bible says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he's about to tell you who's gonna enter into the kingdom. He that doeth the will of my father, James said, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. John said, he that said, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Liar. All right, here's another commandment that's not part of the 10 commandments. This is Acts 2.38. Peter said, repent. We know that you have to repent to be saved. I need y'all help right through here. This is where I'm gonna need. Peter said that you have to repent to be saved. That's a commandment. And you notice the very first thing what he said when they asked him, what must I do to be saved? He said, repent. Did he say get baptized first? Did he say be moral? No. Did he say just go to church? No. He said, repent. That's the first thing he said because it's the most important thing to say to somebody. Because you've sinned, we've all sinned, and the, the law or the commandments are there to show you how you sin. The law, the commandments, the statutes are there to show you, you need God to be saved. You tried it on your own since birth and you messed up many times. We all have. The difference is there are some people who repent and get it right. There are some people who wallow in their iniquity and keep on doing it and just think that God is just going to keep on letting them do it. You think you, there are some people who go to bed at night, they didn't tell God they're sorry for the stuff they did that day and they wake up in the morning, no big deal. The, the commandments are there because if you don't know the commandments, how can you break them? How do you know if you're broken? How can you repent from them? Right? If you didn't know that the Bible says don't lie, how can you repent for life? And yes, you need to repent for your lies. Yes, you need to talk to God about every lie, every curse word, everything that you've done that the Bible says not to do. Everything that you've done in your body that's not like him. All right. Y'all not talking back to me and I need y'all here. And it came to pass that he, as he was come nigh into Jericho, almost done, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. If y'all can read this with me, read it with me. If somebody who needs the Holy Ghost, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to see what the problem is and you'll be able to repent and get the Holy Ghost right now while you're listening to me. And hearing the multitude pass by, this was a dude, he was blind, he was laying around, Jesus was coming through, and when Jesus is coming, everybody's coming, because everybody wants to be around Jesus. I don't believe everybody had good intentions when they wanted to hang around Jesus. I think they just wanted stuff. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to get, well, a lot of them did want to get some inspiration and whatever it is they wanted from them. They always wanted something, that's fine. It's okay, but there's a lot of people coming and blind man can't see the people and he wants to know what's going on. He hear all of the noise, he hear the crowd, and he said, hey, it's just, it's Jesus, he keep walking by. And the blind man said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David. He's acknowledging he know who he is, because he know if you're the son of David, you're God Almighty, you came just like you said even. I can't see you, but I know you're here, and I'm gonna call out, and when he's calling out, Jesus, all the disciples are like, whoa, dude, shut up. Be quiet, you're making too much noise. Calm down. Jesus is here and he's about to start teaching. And the blind man said, Jesus, you ain't blind. You don't know what it's like to lay here. 
and God is about to walk right past you. Your only opportunity to get saved is you about to pass you up. You don't know if he's ever going to walk through here again. And he did. He never walked through that area again. Had the blind man that called out at that moment, he would have missed his only chance to get God's attention. And verse number 39, and they which went before rebuked him and should, that he should hold his peace. That means shut up. But he cried the much more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. I just told you what you need to do to get saved. I just told you how you need to do that. I just told you what you need to do and you're sitting there looking at me. How can you be so peaceful? You're not blind. And if you were blind, that wouldn't be the biggest problem that you have. You can be blind, lame, deaf, all of the above. That wouldn't be a big problem. Your biggest problem is you haven't repented and you have not been filled with the Holy Ghost. If you already have been filled with the Holy Ghost, great, not talking to you. That's the biggest problem. So why aren't you calling out to God? Why aren't you begging him for mercy? Mercy for what? Because I've sinned, God. I've messed up. I've, I've broken your law many times. Anybody here, don't answer. Has anybody here had told a lie? Don't answer, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> Here, here's the problem. It's just a lie, no big deal. But the Bible says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. God got a special part. You got a special place for you in the lake of fire because of that one thing that came out of your mouth. Well, God not gonna send me to hell. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. You better repent instead of being honored and thinking that you don't have to. You better ask God to forgive you. You better cry out to him and you better ask God for mercy because if you don't get mercy, it will be hell to pay. He cried out to Jesus. He didn't care what people told him. He didn't care what people said. He didn't care that people told him to shut up. And these were the apostles that told him to shut up. When you discover that your soul is in trouble, when you really sit down and your soul is in trouble, you won't be passing. People who've been given a death sentence, yep. when the doctor tell them you only got a couple of hours to live, it's amazing how all the stuff that they wanted to do doesn't matter. All their pride is gone. It's all oh, you don't care. You'll do whatever you want because now you got a deathbed confession. Yep. Now you want to talk to God about all the stuff that you did before. Oh man, God, I'm sorry. I'm sure is sorry now. I know I'm about to die and I'm sure is sorry. And that's what some people want to do. I'm too young to get saved, right? I don't want to hit that. I want to have some fun. Being saved being fun. I want to party. I want to smoke. I want to cuss. I want to watch and do TikTok videos or whatever it is that you want to do. I know. It's all right. Go ahead and do it. But for those of you who are under the sound of my voice, for those of you who have the blood running warm in your veins, this is the time to ask God to forgive you for that lie, for that thing you stole for everything that you've ever done. That's against God, you know what it is. That's what you need to beg God to forgive you for. Why are you still looking at me? Why aren't you asking God for forgiveness? Why aren't you asking God for mercy? What do you think is important? Whatever you're doing right now, whatever you have planned to do, God can crack the sky right now. What's stopping him? The, the verse number 39, and they, no, I wanna go to 40. No, 39, and they went, I'm reading, I don't know what I'm reading. No, Luke 18, verse 39. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace, but he cried even more, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought to him. There's a way that you can call God and he'll get his attention. Did you know you can call God right now and he'll send his angels to come and say, bring her to me. That's the way you need to call God. That's, that's gonna take you to get rid of your pride. But while you're in the comfort of your own home, while you're in, the, in your office or wherever you are, that's a good time to start calling on Jesus and ask him to have mercy on you. And notice this guy wasn't quiet because God won't deal with your pride because he doesn't need you. You're nothing to him, you're dirt to him. He's almighty and he created you for a purpose. If you're not serving his purpose, what, what, what does he care about you? You either gonna live for him or just wait and see what happens. Just watch and see what happens. But I, I, you gotta open your mouth and you gotta do more than open your mouth. You gotta get down on your belly because you did some things that you don't want nobody to know about. But baby, it's been recorded. It's already written down in the book and you are going to have to stand there. And the book is gonna be, the Bible says there's a book open with the law, with all the scriptures, and you are gonna be judged out of that book. And that book is going to, 
there's another book of all the stuff you did. And you're going to be, your, your life is going to be judged based on the Bible and what you did. Did what you do match up to that? But I come with some good news because God can swipe that whole plate clean. That whole book can be wiped out. There could be an angel with Jesus' blood with a rag and he'll wipe off every single solitary thing that you've ever done. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. But you got to convince God to do it. You got to convince God that you really are sorry. The Bible says godly sorrow worketh repentance. You got to talk to God for yourself. I wish I could do it. I wish I had a stamp and I can go to my kids. I can go to all three of my daughters and my son and just take that stamp and mark save. Boom, right on your forehead. Hey, wife, boom, save, done. Don't have to worry about it. But I can't save you. I can't do anything for you. I can just direct you to these scriptures and hope you'll catch on and say, I need to do something different. I need to make a change. I need to talk to God. I need to stop caring about how I look. I need to stop worrying about what people are going to say about me. Jesus! Save me, Lord, because I'm in trouble, God. My soul needs you, Lord. I'm in trouble. Look at me, God. I messed up, and when I said I wasn't going to do it anymore, I did it again and again. I need you, God. Help me, Lord. Take this wickedness out of my body, Lord. Take it out of my mind, God. Take the desire away from me, God. Take it and give it to somebody else, but save me, Lord. When you start talking to God like that, when you get a good desire to be saved, imagine what God's going to do for you. You got to open your mouth because your soul is in trouble. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated, for all those people who don't believe in Enoch. Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found because God took him. Because God had translated him. He took him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. What's your testimony? Because Enoch's testimony, testimony was he pleased God. Oh, man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if it's recorded? Selvin, please, God, I'll do anything. I'll man. do anything for that to be written in the Bible. Can you imagine if God wrote down that you please him? What did you do to please God? What did you do today, yesterday, last week? What did you do to please God? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was a ship sinking far from a peaceful shore. I can sing a song that the angel can't sing, and that song is called Redeemed. Because the angels don't know anything about being redeemed because they never was lost. They were never unsaved. They were just holy angels doing the commandments of God. You were lost. You were in sin. And God has given you one good chance. How do you know when it's going to be your last time to repent? How do you know when this, this holiness apostolic message, how do you know when it'll be your last message? How do you know that God's gonna send one more crazy preacher to tell you repent? When will it be, when will it be the last time? What would be your testimony? What, if, what are we gonna put on your tombstone? That you committed, you've done everything, you got the white picket fence, you did everything right, or that you please God? Let that be your testimony. Let that be your plan, let that be your goal, let that be your desire, that your testimony will be that you please God. John 14, 15. We prove to humans the way we love them in many ways. I hug my kids, I hug my wife, I prove that I love them. I cook for them, I buy them gifts, I give them things. That's how we prove that we love each other. That's how humans prove that they love each other. But God recognizes one thing. You can probably guess what that one thing is. And I, you can say, you can tell God you love him a million times, it won't matter. You can cry, you can make up your face. You, I don't know how you would give him a gift. I don't know what you would do. I don't, I, I don't know how or what in your mind you can do to prove to God that you, said, that you love him. But God has one way, John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. It seems like almost every scripture I read has something to do with keeping God's commandments, doesn't it? This is New Testament. This is Jesus' red letter speaking. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now I have a question for you. If you don't keep his commandments, what does that mean? You hate him. What's the opposite of love? <laughs> you can't love him and not keep his commandments at the same time. I'm, don't raise your hand. But raise your hand if you love Jesus. Don't raise your hand. 
So, question. So you can't like them. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing in, I'm just throwing in the curveball. That's that's a, that's a nice curveball. I like you. <laughs> How about that? How about if you're not keeping your commandments, you don't open your big mouth and say you love him. You just say you like him. I like that. Because you can't say you love him. Because the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, how are you going to show God that you love him? Can you make up in your mind that I want to please God? That I want a testimony that I please God? And I, this year, for the rest of this year, I'm going to prove to God that I love him. I'm going to prove to God that I love him. Say that in your mind. I'm going to prove to God I love him. I'm going to prove to God I love him. I'm going to prove to God I love him. All y'all. All four of y'all. I'm going to prove to God I love him. How are you going to do it? How are you going to prove to God you love him? Hi, what? Say it as loud as you can for me. Keep his commandments. Can y'all two say it real loud for me? Keep his commandments! <laughs> y'all loud. Romans 6, 23, 4. <laughs> for the wages of sin is death. Okay? Oh, I'm, I'm right on time, y'all. The wages of sin is death. What you're going to get for sin is death. The payment that for sin is death. Every time you sin, it is death. Something has to die every time there's sin. When Adam sinned, what did God do? Kill the animal right away. He had to shed his blood. When we sin, what did God have to do? I'm gonna tell y'all in a minute. I'm gonna show you what he had to do. Every sin that you commit is recorded on your DNA. Did you know that? You know what your DNA is? Your DNA is your soul. When we talk about your soul, uh, now you know what your soul is. Your soul is your blood, the DNA that runs inside of your blood. Your mind is your spirit. The Bible didn't call it DNA because they didn't have the words for DNA, but your soul is your DNA. Every sin that you commit is written onto your DNA. God can look at your DNA and see whatever you have done. I don't think it matters when you did it, whether you was a child or not, you sinned, you broke the commandments. And every sin is enough to send you to hell and out of the will of God. You remember what the first scripture we had? that God has thoughts for you. He has thoughts of peace to give you an expected end. God doesn't want you to be destroyed. God doesn't want to send you to hell. For the wages of sin is death, but God has a gift for you. He has a gift of eternal life. And how do you get the gift of eternal life? I'm so glad you asked. Through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews, I don't know what that is, 922 or 822? All right. Hey, Tristan, you like this, right? I got all the scriptures. Ain't nobody got to look through them. Ain't nobody got to find them. Rocking, ready to go. Ready to roll. <laughs> and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. This is important. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There has to be blood to remit your sins. When Adam sinned, we talked about that already, Adam sinned, God had to kill an animal. After that, when the tabernacle, when Moses had the tabernacle, and when people sinned, you had to bring an animal, your animal, your pet. So just imagine you have a pet. Do you have a pet? What's your pet's name? Ninja. Ninja? What is Ninja? The dog's name is Ninja? Okay. Just imagine you told a lie, because this is how it used to be. You got to take Ninja. Take him to the tabernacle, take him to the priest. The priest had to kill him. While the priest is killing him, you have to hold your hand. Hold your hand on Ninja. Your hand has to be touching the animal. The priest takes his knife, kills him. Takes his blood, takes it inside, and sprinkles it, sprinkles it on the ark. You did that. You caused that. If you go back home and you sin again, you better go find another animal. All these animals gotta die just because of you. Go find, you gotta go find, I don't know which animal, we can go into that later on. Maybe somebody else can do a study on that. But there was an animal that was, I'm sorry? Wouldn't be a dog. It wouldn't be a dog, it would probably be a goat or a turtle dove. I don't know what it was, but it would be something. It's gotta be, it's gotta be clean, it's gotta be the first of everything. Yes, it's gotta have broken yeah. legs. It gotta be something that you need, that you no, want, a, a valuable. Right. Without, without spotting the right. Yes, and, and, and that animal, whether it was yours or not, because you're gonna run out of animals, right? You bring this animal and you had to have your hand on there and then your hand on that animal is sure You did this. You're not gonna be at home and just bring the animal and give it to him and, and go home. You did this. You're gonna watch what happens because you caused this thing. And 
before G this was before Jesus died, of course. And it had to be a perfect animal, like you just said. Look at the problem you got. If they took all of those animals, just think about all the sins you committed in your body, in your lifetime. Look at all the animals that are lined up because of you. All these animals had to die because of you. Look at this little cute little animal. Look at it. Ain't he cute? You want one? You want you want to train ninja in for that? I don't think he's cute. You don't think it was a kid? No. It makes me hungry. Us Jamaicans would tear that thing up. We pour some curry on it right now. <laughs> and if the soul that sinned through ignorance, then he, what does that mean? Um, and unconsciously sin. If you sin and you didn't know it was a sin. If you sin and you didn't know it was in the Bible. It's for all of you people who think that you're going to get away with something because you didn't know. You have to keep the commandments, all of them, even the ones you don't know. Even the ones you didn't read. That's your fault you didn't read the Bible. It's your fault you don't know what's in your book. It's your fault that you don't know what the commandments that you have to keep. If the soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat. Well, that just answered my question. Because there's an animal that you have to bring for each sin. So for this sin, if you sin and you didn't know you sin, I'm trying to think of a, a sin that you didn't know. You repeated something. Somebody told you something at school. You repeated it to her. And you found out it was a lie. You just lied shouldn't have said it. You should have found out first. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. So now you just lied, but you didn't know you told us. Is that a good example? Probably not. You got a better one for me? <laughs> a a uh, sin that you can commit through ignorance? I would say if you... Um... Whatever the animal is while you're thinking, whatever, the, whatever sin you committed, you had to bring a baby goat, a female goat, and it couldn't be more than a year old. So it had to be a nice little cute baby. That's valuable. That's valuable. You can get a lot of milk from this thing. You can sell it. You can feed your whole family. We can get them um, a grown one. And we can feed our entire family, feed the whole district with it. That first year, that one year old um, animal, goat, had to be murdered because of you sinning and you didn't even know it. Does it sound like God is playing about the sins that you do commit and you do know? You got an example? I can't think of one. Okay. That same requirement still happens. That has not changed. The only thing that changed is God has became those animals. He became the lamb so that he only had to die one time for all of your past sins. Don't let nobody trick you and think God died for your future sins. That doesn't make any sense because the Bible says if you willfully sin, there remaineth no sacrifice. So after you are saved, after you have repented of your sins, after you've been baptized in Jesus' name, which is the most powerful name, the name that's given among men, the way you must be saved. After you're baptized in Jesus' name, and after you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you sin then, then there's no more sacrifice. That means you gotta start all over. It's, you basically just kill God all over again, and you will be charged with killing God all over again. But before you get the Holy Ghost, you still have to have shed blood shed for you. So Jesus shed the blood, but how does that help you? How do you get that blood applied to you? How does that blood get applied to you for that animal that you didn't put your hand on? You didn't put your hand on Jesus. How does that happen? It happens through a process called forgiveness. How do you get forgiveness? Through repentance. You have an assignment and it's the greatest assignment in the world. That assignment is to get God to forgive you. Don't go to bed another night. Don't go to the bathroom anymore. Don't eat anymore. Get down on your face. Get down on your belly. Beg God to forgive you. Plead the blood of Jesus for forgiveness. God's blood is applied when you obtain forgiveness. Then your DNA is cleansed when you obtain forgiveness. And now you can stand before God boldly and say, Lord, I have given and repented of all of my sins. And now God can receive you. Got it? The only difference is God removed the middleman, which was the priest who had slaughtered the animal. He has become the middleman. He is the middleman, but you still have to get that blood applied through forgiveness. God has to forgive you. Almost done. Trust me. We're going to be right on time. Nine minutes. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So when you, every time you sin, you kill Jesus all over again, which means you are guilty of his death. All right. If you, if I regard iniquities in my heart, you like that picture there? If you regard iniquities in my heart, 
the Lord doesn't hear me. If you are sinning and you're com continuing to sin, the Bible says God doesn't hear you. This is why you need the Holy Ghost. It's not optional. Your soul depends on it. He's the only one who can wipe your slate clean. He's the only one who can cleanse your DNA. You need the Holy Ghost. You can only get forgiveness from God. If I forgive you, that's good, but it doesn't matter. If the uh, your pastor forgives you, great. If the judge forgives you, great. You need God to forgive you. You need the Holy Ghost. Don't leave this earth without it. How badly do you want God to forgive you? What are you willing to give up? How bad do you want God to forgive you? And what are you willing to give up? Romans 8 and 9. This is the scripture I dreaded the most of you. I couldn't yeah. stand it. I <laughs> hated when they, and I think there was one particular person. Oh gosh, when she would read this scripture on purpose just to fix me, I couldn't stand it. But ye are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If so, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Listen very carefully. This is why I hated this scripture, because it's, you, what are you gonna do about it? It's 100% true. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, what is the spirit of Christ? Holy Ghost. If any man have not the Holy Ghost, he is none of his. What are you gonna do with that? How can you be saved without the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is your keeper. The Holy Ghost is your redeemer. The Holy Ghost is your comforter. The Holy Ghost is your soul cleaner. The Holy Ghost is your pathway to heaven. The Holy Ghost is your proof that you're God's child. The Holy Ghost is proof that you have gotten forgiveness. The Holy Ghost is proof that you repented. How can you be saved without the Holy Ghost? Without the Holy Ghost, you're not his. You need the Holy Ghost. Give me one second. I know you got a question, but give me one second because I'm going to give you this acronym. I create this acronym is going to teach you how to get the Holy Ghost. What's the acronym? ASK, that's my acronym for today. This is how you're going to get the Holy Ghost. It's a three-step process, real easy to do. You listening? You want the Holy Ghost? You want the Holy Ghost? If you listen to what I'm telling you, if you do it right now, you listen to what I'm telling you right now, you get the Holy Ghost right now. I see your hand raised, but give me one second. The first thing you have to do is ask. John 3.22 says, and whatsoever we ask. Did you ask God for the Holy Ghost today? How are you gonna get the Holy Ghost? Whatever we, and by the way, the Holy Ghost, the Bible says the only, that while we're talking about getting forgiven, let me just pause for a minute here. The Holy Ghost the, is the only sin that you can commit that God will not forgive you for. God will forgive you for everything you do, but he will not forgive you if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? If you say anything about the Holy Ghost, it better be 100% positive or shut your mouth. Don't say nothing about the Holy Ghost. God will not forgive you if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. And that's fine because there's so many other things that you've done and God will forgive you for. But don't say anything negative about the Holy Ghost. And another thing that I noticed that people are doing, they're calling the Holy Ghost an it. If I called you an it, isn't that mean? Isn't that rude? The Holy Ghost is a person, it's a him. And that's why people don't get the Holy Ghost because they're expecting an it to come from out of the sky and I don't know what they're expecting. The Holy Ghost is Jesus coming into your life. That's why you have to ask him to forgive you. That's why you need a relationship with him. You need to talk to him, tell him, yes, you died for me. And yes, I've messed up, but I'm asking you to forgive me. It's a person. And when I got the Holy Ghost, I literally felt a person or a wind or something walk into my body. And if there was cameras and all the people over there, they saw the exact movement. Something came into me. Somebody came into me, not something. If the Holy Ghost is a person. His name is Jesus, not an it. All right. Here's my three-step acronym. Ask. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Why do we receive what we ask of him? Because we keep his commandments. And in addition to keeping the commandments, we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. How are you gonna get the Holy Ghost if you think you don't have to keep the commandments? How are you gonna get the Holy Ghost if you don't make up in your mind that you need to keep the commandments? All of them. Everything that's written in that book, yes. The first thing you gotta do, is repent for breaking the commandments. Humble yourself enough to ask for forgiveness for every single one. What about begging? What about groveling? Is that necessary? How are you gonna convince God that you'll never break a commandment again if you weren't sorry in the first place for the commandments that you've already broken? 
So ASK, that's the that's the acronym. This is the first step. I got two more. We out of here. For everyone, this is Matthew 7, 8. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And he that knocketh, it shall be open. I just gave y'all my acronym. Ask, because the Bible, Bible says ask. Seek, A-S, S for seek, you like that? K for knock. Acronym, A-S-K, you like it? Okay. You got to recognize you need them. Your soul can be lost by doing nothing. We have some pamphlets and we're gonna go, we're gonna pass them out. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna walk around, we're gonna go back on the streets, we're gonna pass these pamphlets out. The, the reason I um, chose this particular pamphlet because it says, what do I have to do to go to hell? I like it because when you open it, the first thing it says is nothing. You can just be born, that's it. That's all you gotta do, just be born. Don't do anything. It's already set up for you. Because you've already been born in Satan and iniquity. You've already sinned. Everybody has sinned. You don't do anything. Or you can confess your sins to God. God, I'm a sinner. I'm showing y'all how to do this. I'm showing y'all how to do this. I'm showing you the mindset. I showed y'all the mindset. I showed y'all what you have to do. I showed y'all that you have to obey the commandments. I showed y'all scriptures where you have to obey the commandments, where Jesus told you have to obey the commandments. And when the people asked him, Jesus told them, obey the commandments. So now in my mind, I know I have to obey all of the commandments. And I also know that I did not always obey all the commandments. I messed up because I broke some of those commandments. So now I need to ask God to forgive me. I need to, to seek him for the forgiveness. God has to be your desire. I know you want to get up in the morning and you want to do this or that, sit over there. And you want to play and you want to do this and you want to go to work, you have all of this. But the Bible says, God, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy might. God has to be your desire. When, you, when you're when looking to receive the Holy Ghost, when you really want to receive the Holy Ghost, everybody will know it because you don't care where you are. You can be in the park, you can be in church, you can be at home and nothing will matter. You can get down on your knees. And I, when I got the Holy Ghost, I got down on my knees and in my mind, I was not getting back up until God forgave me. Because I knew that the goal wasn't to get the Holy Ghost. Your goal has to be less interest in getting the Holy Ghost and more interest in getting God to forgive you. So I was willing to stay on, the, on my knees and I told God, I'm not getting up from here. I already had in my mind, I'm going to be here for three days, four days, whatever it takes. And I'm going to keep asking you, God, to forgive me. I'm going to keep on doing what I have to do to get you to believe that I am never going to sin again. I'm not going to break your commandments. If you help me, God, I'll do what you say. I'll follow hard after you. You're all I want, God. You're all I need. You're my only heart's desire. There's nothing else in this world that matters, God. There's nothing else that I want, God. Take all of this stuff out of me, God, and make me clean just like you, God. I want to live holy, Jesus. I want to walk up right before you. I want you to be my desire, God. I don't want nothing else, God. If you have to take everything away from me, Jesus, if I have to go live under a body all by myself, God, I'll do it, Jesus, because my desire is to be with you and to follow hard after you. God wants to be God of all, or he doesn't want to be God at all. He has to be all you want. This is how you seek God. You have to seek a way to, to get God to forgive you. You have to figure that out. Imagine if somebody did something really harsh and horrible to you. Imagine if they just said, okay, I'm sorry. My bad. I don't want to give any examples, but I can give, come up with some really harsh stuff. But just imagine somebody did something really bad to you and they just said, my bad. That, that's what you, that, that, that won't work with God because you sin, you bad, you bad did a whole bunch of times and you need to get God to forgive you for all of those bad did what? what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up? Today, today that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Whatever it is, let it go. It's not worth it. Let it go. It's not worth it. Whoever it is, let him go. Whoever she is, let her go. Whatever it is, let it go. If you're working in a job and the job is requiring you to do something that's against the commandments, let it go. If your heart is for somebody that is not supposed to be for, let them go. If you're watching something and you can't and you know you have no business watching it, do whatever you have to do, but let it go. It's not worth it. And then tell God you're sorry. Seek him through your life. 
Find all the stuff that you're sorry for. Get down on your knees. Get down on your belly. And when you really want to be saved, knees ain't good enough. I'm getting down on my belly. I'm getting down on my face. And I'm begging you, God, I'll be here for the rest of the week until you forgive me. You don't hear this in church. You don't hear this kind of message in church. They just tell you, oh, just raise your hand. Or just give your hand to the preacher. Or just put your hand on the Bible. They just, I'm telling you that you need to beg God to forgive you because your soul is in trouble. And finally, no, it's not finally. This is S. We got one more. We're gonna do seek, and then we're done. And we went to meet Asa and said unto him, Her, hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you. While ye be with him, and if you seek him, he will be found in you. God is telling you, just go on and seek me. Look for me. Spend some time with me. Try to get in touch with me. I'm gonna let you find me if you seek me. Isn't that nice? Because God has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. But if you will forsake him, he will forsake you. How would you know when you're found God? He'll let you know when you've been forgiven. There'll be a physical response upon his arrival. Remember I said it's not a thing. When God shows up, he's gonna show up. He's gonna let you know he's there and he's gonna tell you he's there and he'll tell everybody he's there. You'll know when you've been forgiven. And the reason I'm saying that, because you have to continue doing it. You have, to, you have to continue doing it until he literally forgives you. You have to keep asking. You can't just say, okay, well, I asked him, I'm done. You gotta keep on doing it. When the police shows up at your house, and I hope you don't have any reference, but this is my last life. When the police shows up at your house, they don't knock. <laughs> when the police shows up at your house, they knock the door like they're gonna knock it down to the ground. I'm here. That's how you have to knock when you really want to get the Holy Ghost. You have to knock against your flesh. Your first thing you need to knock against is your pride because that is the biggest thing that's stopping people from getting saved. Oh, how I'm going to look. Oh, people are going to laugh at me. But you remember the blind dude? He didn't care. He just called on you. He didn't care how he looked. He didn't care how he sounded. You need to knock against your flesh, against your pride, against your drinking, against your smoking, against your lying, against everything that you've done that's not like it. You need to knock at it. You need to fight it. You need to get it out of the way. You need to do what you have to do. You have to pack up and move. Do it. I'm done. May the Lord bless you all. I'm sorry, you have a question. Oh yeah, yeah, I had a question. You gotta go back a few slides. And, um, I think it was on the part where you were talking about uh, if you don't have the spirit. Oh, I think it was the Romans one. It should be um, Romans eight and nine. Is that what you're talking about? If you have not yeah, the spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Right. Right. So, question is: is that If it? you do get it. Okay, if you do get it, you know, let's say you get it, you know, everything going good and you do something. Is there a way you can lose it if once you have it? So this is this is why I was saying that the, the Holy Ghost isn't a thing. It's a person. And you don't lose right, so, a person. So, right. So you can't lose him once you have him. Once he steps inside of your body, he's there. And he's going to take full control. He's going to rule because he's all he's God almighty. He's going to take residence in this place. He's going to set up shop and he's going to take full control until you sin. And when you sin, he'll just say, okay, that's what you want to do. He'll now you got to start all over again. He'll hmm? convict you. Try and really yes, he'll do everything he can. You're 100% right. He'll convict you. Don't do it. I'm warning you not to do it. He'll make it. He'll make it. So if you go down that street, if you dial that number, if you go, if you click that website, he'll do all of that. And when you mess up, he'll be like, okay. And guess what you have to do? You have to repent all over again. You have to get back on your knees and beg God to forgive you again. And I and I have seen people do this, and it's like they have to repent more than they did before. They have to they have to beg God. I've seen people crawl from the back of the church to the pulpit, just wallowing themselves on the floor, begging God to forgive them, wallowing on themselves in front of the altar, begging God to forgive them. And sometimes it takes them a long time. Sometimes I've seen it take years. But you really got to want it. And God is a jealous God. When you sin, you hurt his feelings. You, I know God, I know God has feelings. The Bible said Jesus wept. He got feelings. 
You heard him when you sinned because he's giving you everything. He's helping you. He gave you the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the power that you need to never sin again. When he steps into your body, you have everything you need not to sin again. But if you do sin again, there's still an avenue for you to get saved. All you have to do is repent and God will stand right back up and say, all right, I got you. Don't do it no more. Because if you see whenever somebody sinned in the Bible, whenever God dealt with somebody with that sin, let's take Mary Magdalene. When she sinned, she got caught. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not hearsay. She got caught. She came to Jesus. And what I mean, after she got caught, Jesus took care of her accusers. And then he told her what? Go and don't do that anymore. No. He said, go and sin no more. Don't do nothing no more. Don't break any commandments no more. Don't mess up anymore. Go and sin. Don't do no more sin, no more, no more sin. And if you go to the Bible, every time you see when Jesus was dealing with somebody, that's what he did every time. He told him, don't sin no more. Don't do it anymore. But he is a forgiving God. And sin isn't a problem for him. He came because of sin. Sin is not a problem for God. He can deal with that. If you truly repent, and you do truly repentance means, I want to keep all of his commandments to show him that I love him. I hope that answers your question. Okay, another question. You had a question. You had a question earlier. You, you had a question earlier. I know this is all new to you. I'm sorry if it's scary. It's okay. But if you have a question, you understand everything I said? Okay, sweet. We have guests okay. today. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, another question. How many commandments are there to keep? Woo! Well, I think somebody counted them and it was 615. But that includes all of the, the laws that we don't have to do anymore. So when they say 615, that's just people who try to say, well, there's 615 commandments in the Bible. Do you keep everyone? That's what they'll do. They, there are laws in the Bible that we do not have to keep anymore because there are laws specific to the temple that we don't have anymore. There were laws that you had, there was a law that you had to wash a certain way when you went into the temple. That law doesn't exist because there's no more temple. There was a law that the priest had to go and sprinkle blood on the, uh, the way he had to sprinkle the blood from the sacrifice onto the ark. That was a law, that doesn't count. So now we're down to 613. So we can back down off of all of them, okay? But that's not what God is looking for, the ceremonial laws and the um, sacrificial laws. God's not, God has dealt with those, but God expected okay, so I, all the other laws. The, okay, so my other question is with that law, uh, I like seafood, cause you know what I'm saying. I have a, I have a I have a message coming up on, them, but seafood. <laughs> if you read that, if you if you read the, the the law on seafood, here's where people get messed up at, because the Bible says being a homosexual is a an abomination. Right. You can go through the Bible and you can see where the Bible specifically says, for example. If a man lies with a man, this is what it says. I'm quoting it. I might guess that. If a man lies with a man, the way he lies with a woman is an abomination unto me. Okay. Right. Now, when you go and you read the dietary laws, the Bible says, don't eat these items because it's an abomination unto you. That's what people miss. There's two different types mm -hmm. of abominations. One is to you and one is to me. If it's an abomination unto God, you better not do it. It's to you in trouble. If it's an abomination unto you, you're just stupid for doing it. Because God is telling you, I didn't create <laughs> your body to take these animals. I didn't create these animals for consumption. These animals, right, I okay. created them to clean the earth. You should not be eating them. It's not good for you. Leviticus 2013, read it for me. Sorry, I didn't have it. I'm so so <laughs> eating, eating the abominable foods isn't a sin that will keep you out of heaven. It's just dumb to eat them because they don't have any nutritional value and it's killing you. So maybe well, they taste good. If a man, if a man, and if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. He shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's a, that's an abomination that's separate. Now, if you find the one where it talks about abominable food, swine, just whatever. If you look at that one, it says an abomination unto you. So. Normally, whenever you have an issue, it's because of the thing that you want to do. Normally, the goal should be to please God. The goal should be to have a testimony that you please God. If I eat these items that the Bible says not to eat, am I pleasing God? What if I'm what if I'm dead wrong? And I eat these items, and God, when I get before God, God says, Oh, you could have ate them, I don't care. You could have ate them about that. You could have ate whatever you wanted to eat. 
And that's amazing that people think that God will say that because God has a law for what you wear. He has a law for what you look at. He has a law for what you think. He has a law for everything you do, but whenever it comes to eating, eat whatever you want. I don't care. That sound like God? No, God has a standard and a rule for everything you do and it includes what you put into your temple. What you put into your temple matters because All the right. Holy Ghost, the Bible says your body is the temple of God. And I'm gonna go a little further because I'm gonna have to deal with this one day because the Bible <laughs> talks about, the in Revelation it talks about when you see the desolation, the abomination of desolation. Abomination of desolation. That was when they took a pig into the temple and sacrificed it. That's the worst thing you could have done. And they did that on purpose to taunt God. I got you. I see you, baby. And you, you, you're taunting God because you're taking up an abomination into the temple and you're trying to sacrifice God uh, in God's temple and what he called an abomination. If your body is the temple, should you be putting that same thing in your body? It's not good for you anyway. And I'm just going to say this right here. If you look at the number one reason for black people dying just in America, for example, the number one reason we die is because of heart disease. What are the heart disease? What are the reasons why we have heart disease? High blood pressure, high cholesterol. I, we have issues with cholesterol, um, um, sugar, diabetes too, but that's not the number one reason we're dying. The highest concentration of, chole of cholesterol and sodium in any animals are all found in the animals God said don't eat. If black people would simply obey the book that God gave to them, and they would just not eat the food that God said don't eat. Black people alone will live longer and they won't have these issues. Simple as that. This is more proof that we are the chosen people because everybody else can eat it and they don't have the issues that we have. They don't have hypertension like we have. They don't have high cholesterol like we have. They can eat it and it's okay. God said for my people, you, I created you special. Don't eat these, just a couple animals. Lamb tastes better than pork anyway. Okay. All day long, and it's, it's more healthy for you anyway. So that's that's an issue, and that was hard for me. But I, I remember, my daughter can tell you, there was one time I sat down and ate 100 shrimp, and I wanted more. The only reason I stopped eating 100 shrimp because they were making money of me and I was ready to go. Otherwise, I would eat 200, easily. Because it was good shit. When Red, Lob Red Lobster had shrimp scampy, all you can eat, that they were mad at me. The lady brought 10 at a time. I'm like, you you wasting your time. You need to just bring all of it and then take back what I want because I'm going to eat a lot. She just keep bringing 10 at a time. Okay. But when I read the word and because I have a desire to please God, I let it go without question. And I'm so glad that I'm living in a family where they honor me enough that when I say, thus said the Lord, there's no argument, not in this house. They just, they love me so much. They love the word so much. They love God so much, it's not an issue. So, and all that have not fins and scales in the sea and in the rivers and all the moving in the water and all the living things which is in the water, they shall be an abomination unto you. Good job. Leviticus 11, 10. That's Leviticus 11, 10. It says an abomination unto you. So no, you're not gonna go to hell for eating it, but it's just not a good idea. KK, you had a question, sweetie? Um, Yeah, I wrote it in the chat, can you see? Okay, so I, I know that the Catholics believe that um, contraceptives is a sin, and I can tell you exactly where they got that from. Actually, I don't know what, what scripture it is, but God wanted to establish a seed on the earth with a specific family line. All the kids are gone. Okay, so all the kids are gone, so I can answer your question now. So he told dude, bro man, to go have sex with such and such, whoever the girl was, because he wanted to establish a bloodline through that person. He went, had sex with him, with her, and the Bible says when his seed touched the ground, God slew him. The angel of the Lord killed him right on the spot. Boom, done. So. That's a reason why there are some people who don't have the understanding of the scripture think that contraceptives is a sin. God expects us to use good common sense. God expects us to have good stewardship over what he's given us. God don't want us having 20 kids and we can't take care of them because the Bible says a man that doesn't take care of his kids is worse than an infidel. You have to be able to take care of your kids. You have to make good decisions. Every person that has saved full of the Holy Ghost, on their way to being with Jesus, 
you have a job on earth to do with your fleshly things as well as your spiritual things. Let's put the spiritual things to the side. You still are a mother, you still are a father, you still are a son, you still have to take care of those things. And taking care of those things don't mean you just sit around and have kids all day. So no, contraceptives are not a sin because contraceptive does, um, does not kill or stop any human life. It simply doesn't. The day after pill is just a high dosage of uh, the um, pill, whatever you call it, pill. I don't know what the pill is. Is there a scripture on that? Um, yeah, I can go to the one that you were talking about when we were talking about the other day that says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So can you find it? The, the, the soul doesn't enter until that baby until a certain day. Because remember, we talked about DNA. What is DNA? DNA is your soul. Your body is nothing. If I chop off my arms and they give me new arms, it, it doesn't, doesn't change who I am. You could chop off my whole body, my face, everything, give me a new one. It doesn't change my DNA, it doesn't change who I am. I am my DNA and my DNA doesn't enter into my body until the third day, fourth day. I don't know, we can look that up. Uh, Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is inside of the blood. Leviticus uh, 17, 11. The life of the flesh is inside of the blood. The soul is inside of the blood. If you would have killed Adam before God put blood in him, did you murder him? Did you kill a soul? He doesn't have a soul. He doesn't have blood. Your blood, your DNA is your soul. So if you're taking barrier methods, if you're taking things that's going to uh, prevent you from having a baby, if you're doing that before there's blood, it's 100% fine. Because it's not a, a, a baby, it's not a soul, it's not a living soul until you have that blood inside of you. That's why the Bible says after God breathed, breathed that uh, DNA into Adam, then he became a living soul. So Adam was just standing up or just laying down or whatever, just there, he's nothing until God put that blood inside of him. I answer? have another angle. What if like birth control, you know, it ruins your body. Like, what about that? You're not supposed to put anything that harms your body. Like that's man-made in your body, right? Well, you're not supposed to kill your body, I would say. So I wouldn't take anything that's going to kill my body, like smoking and, and drinking, that is slowly killing your body. That's destroying God's temple. If uh, if you, I mean, if you eat some um, a piece of candy and it has artificial flavor and your body doesn't digest that because it's artificial and it doesn't know what to do with it, and that turns into fat, are you killing your body or destroying your body? No. I, I, I don't, God is not being dogmatic. God is not being with, with a lightning bolt. This is what I used to think. God has a lightning bolt waiting on you to mess up. Go ahead, sin, watch what's gonna happen. I'm gonna get you good. Go ahead, mess up. And then, no, God wants you to make good decisions based on his word. And the way I live my life, if it's not in the word, if it's in the word, I gotta do it. And there's no scripture. Instead of looking, let's reverse it. Is there a scripture that tells you you can't take birth? So there's none, not a single one. Sorry, Catholics, it's not in there. Catholics believe life begins at conception, which is insane. Because it, it, there's no soul in that baby until it has a heartbeat. Five weeks. Five weeks, didn't you read something sooner? Whenever it is, I think you said, yeah, I think you, I don't know why I said days, but I believe the heartbeat starts in five weeks, right? In five weeks, so the fourth week, that baby doesn't have a heartbeat, it doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have DNA, it's not a human. So you're not doing anything at that point. If you're taking medication or you, and, the, and let's say the doctor gives you medication that that medication causes you to have blood pressure, but you is fixing another problem. For example, you're not hurting yourself. Uh, you're not committing any sin because you're taking medication. You're not hurting yourself and there's nothing wrong with taking birth control pills if it's making you fat or if it's, if it's making you have high blood pressure. I don't think it's, if it's not killing you, I think it's okay. I think I think a lot of times they well it has killed people <laughs> yeah because it raised their blood pressure up yes we've had that issue before uh, that that means but if you would if some people would have changed the diet and lowered their blood pressure maybe what are you saying I'm sorry. i think that some churches um think uh, contraception is wrong because the bible told that if you gave this command to adam be fruitful and multiply okay Right. So, yes, that's a good point. I think that's what they get it from. I, that, that's an excellent point. The reason why they think contraceptives is bad is because they, the uh, Bible, God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply, but they stopped there. 
You have to read it in context. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. The earth is pretty plenish. So take your birth control, find one, a barrier method, whatever you have to do, take it so that you can, can make good decisions and that you can have a kid when it's best for you to have a kid. That's what I think God would want you to do. I don't think God wants you to, to get married today, have 10 kids, can't and suffer and can't feed them. That, that makes no sense to me. That's not God's will at all under no circumstances. Hey, Pops, I had a question. Yes, I was waiting. Uh, is with fasting or can fasting be a form of repentance? No. So they have been, they have done studies on people's brains, whatever they call it, MRI, whatever they do, and they can show the brain activity. You ever seen when they do that? And then they have like colors in your brain when you're using more of that particular brain. So like it would be red here if you are angry or something like that. So they have done mm -hmm. that when people have been praying. They show the colors when you're praying. It's amazing how they, they, your brain uh, lights up in one area when you start to pray, because that's just your spirit. So let's just say right here, your brain is red when you're praying. What they have, what they have done, you can see this on YouTube, is when people fast, that red area is all over now. So fasting, all fasting does is prepare you to pray. It gets you ready to pray. It's a, it's, it doesn't do anything for God or to God. All fasting does is help you somehow in your mind prepare you to be more focused because your brain is not using so much of the blood to digest your food, for example. You, you, that red area, and I don't know why, I don't, I really don't know why, that red area is expanded throughout more of your brain. You can use more of your brain waves to pray and talk to God about fasting. Uh -huh. Is fasting a form of repentance? Oh, it gets so, you ready yes. for it. Right, now it does help. And when I was growing up, when I was in my teenage years, I fasted for weeks because yeah. I wanted the Holy Ghost back. Not not every, every day, not for a whole week. The mm -hmm. longest I fasted was uh, three days. And that was after I got the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost to fast like that. But we were fasting when you got the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but I cheated. I cheated a little bit till that last day. <laughs> ah, I cheated until that last day. I didn't know. <laughs> and even the day before I went to go see my daughter, so. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. When 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 you really want the Holy Ghost, the only thing you have to do, and, it, and listen, this is what messed me up, and this is what I hated about our our my people before me, our forefathers, I guess. They didn't have the the way of explaining what I tried to do today. They they didn't have the words to explain what you need to do, what mindset you need to have. I would go to church and tarry. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. For hours. I'm talking, it's two o'clock in the morning, sometimes four o'clock in the morning. There's been times where I tarried until the sun came back up. And then just then then you just sit there just so disappointed. What the, I did everything. I did everything they told me to do. Because the saints will come around you and they will tell you, say hallelujah. They say it fast. Say thank you, Jesus. Call out to God. Hold give up to him. Up. Hold on to him. What do you want me to do? Hold on, give it up. What do you, I, can't, I can't make up your mind. But all they had to do was just explain that you need to want God more than you want anything. You need to want God to forgive you more than you want anything. And a good way of explaining that is if you found out that KK came home and she was pregnant and she walked in the room and said, my bad, not by you, pregnant by somebody else. What would she have to do? Because in, in my mind, there is no forgiveness. But what would she have to say? What would she have to do to get you to forgive her? What does she have to do to get you to forgive her? Because whatever that would be, that's what God is looking for you to do. That same type of groveling, that same type of begging, that same type of God, please help me, mm -hmm. save me, I need you. That type of response, that's what you have to do to get the Holy Ghost. But once you make up in your mind, and I'm mad because getting the Holy Ghost was so easy. It, it took no time. Once I decided I really want God to forgive me, why is this today? I really want God to forgive me? It took nothing. It took two seconds. You can get the Holy Ghost in five minutes. You just have to want him to forgive you more than you want anything. But the problem is, while you're thinking, I want the Holy Ghost. I want to do this. I want to be saved. And of course, that's a good thing. I believe you, you, all your hearts are right. I believe you want that. I believe you want to be saved. But when there's a thing, that, that thing that comes up in your mind, that thing that you think of, 
That's the problem. Well, I'm not going to be able to fill in the blank. That's the problem. And, and this is the problem. Because remember the guy that I told you, God told him you had to sell your riches. That was his thing. That was his God. I have another example in my mind, but I can't think of it right now. But there's there's been, everybody has their thing. I had mines. Believe it or not, mines was music. I had my, I loved my reggae. And this was before I had access to gospel reggae like that. Music was my thing. I just, I, I, I don't want to be saved and give up music at the same time and listen to this old dumb, boring music y'all got. And I don't want to go to all these dumb church services y'all have. Y'all have church too much. I don't want to be in church service. I'm young. I want to have some fun. But when I got to the point where I wanted to be saved, that didn't even matter. And now I'm having more fun than I would have had. I got better music now than I would.